Okay, so I'll be honest from the start. Um, I became an archaeologist purely by accident. Um, I came from a background in classical literature at uh, undergrad um, and kind of segued into British folklore during my MA at the University of Manchester. Uh, and by the time it came to apply for my PhD, I didn't really belong in any department. Um, I was a bit of an academic nomad. So um, applying, I, I just applied to, to every department. Um, I thought history might have been the obvious choice for studying British folklore, um, but they didn't want me. Uh, I thought maybe anthropology, um, but they kind of just ushered me along. Um, and in the end, it was the Department of Archaeology at Manchester um, which kindly gave me a home. And although at the time I was uh, very, very grateful, um, it was with some hesitation that I kind of took on their methodologies because at the time they didn't seem so um, appropriate for a study of, of folklore. Um, but this paper is, is just to demonstrate how wrong I was um, in thinking that. Um, but first things first, I'll just um, give a, a brief consideration of folklore as a term. Um, it seems to be frowned upon quite a lot in um, some academic disciplines, um, particularly in Britain. Um, and I had to dedicate half the chapter of my thesis just justifying my use of the term folklore. Um, so please forgive me if I don't um, use a half of this paper doing the same. But very briefly, in my opinion, um, although folklore has developed some negative connotations, uh, no other word works quite so well. No other word encapsulates what folklore encapsulates. So I suggest that we strip back all of the negative connotations and just use the term as it was originally meant to be used. Um, when it was coined in 1846 by William Toms, who suggested it um, in a letter to the Athenaeum as an alternative to what we in England designate as popular antiquities. Uh, he recommended instead a good Saxon compound, folklore, the law of the people. So folklore is, um, on its simplest level, just the law of the people. Um, who are the people? Well, folklorist Alan Dundas gives his definition. Um, the term folk can refer to any group of people whatsoever who share at least one common factor. Um, and this common factor is usually geographic location, but can be anything from occupation, religion, language, shared hobbies, um, and any traditions that they transmit orally amongst themselves are subsequently considered folklore. But if orality is so central to folklore, then how can archaeology assist me in my research? Well, it didn't take me long to realize just how important materiality is to the study of folklore. And I'm going to demonstrate this today by looking at um, one of my main research interests, the concealed shoe. Well, first things first, what is a concealed shoe? Um, and surprisingly, it's a shoe that's been concealed. Now, it was in the 1950s when June Swan, the former keeper of the boot and shoe collection of Northampton Museum, first noticed a recurring pattern in finds being donated to her department. So a wide range of footwear, dating primarily to the 18th and 19th centuries, um, was brought to her attention, having been discovered in unusual locations within buildings. Um, so, uh, for instance, the roof space up in the rafters, uh, in the thatching of cottages, in the attic, um, built into the actual walls of a house, uh, under the stairs, under the floorboards, uh, up the chimney breast, uh, in the fireplace, under the hearth. Now, accidental loss uh, could account for some of these locations, uh, but most of the shoes were in such odd places that they had to have been deliberately placed there, deliberately concealed. Uh, I'm thinking of the ones that are balanced on top of rafters, ones that are balanced on, on narrow ledges up chimney breasts, um, ones that are built into the walls. Now, noting how strange these locations were, June Swan took it upon herself to gather as much data as possible on this unfamiliar, previously unstudied phenomenon. As the numbers of these finds multiplied, it became increasingly obvious that the concealing of shoes was a widespread practice. So in 1969, Swan listed 129 such shoes. By 1986, the number had grown to 700. By 1996, 1,550 such shoes had been recorded, and the numbers continued to grow. So the last time I contacted Northampton Museum, 
which was about a month ago, um, and they hold a fantastic index of um, concealed shoes. They had records of 1,900. Now, various types of shoes have been found, working class shoes, upper class shoes, women's, men's, um, and quite a, a significantly high proportion of children's. Uh, for possible reasons I'll consider in a moment. Um, the vast majority of them were in England, although they are found elsewhere, some examples from Scotland, Wales, um, overseas, uh, America, Australia. Um, the vast majority of them, I'm oh, sorry, uh, the majority, 43%, were found in uh, cottages, 26% uh, in urban buildings, 11% in farm buildings, 9% in manor houses and mansions, um, and the remaining in town halls, public houses, churches, etc. Uh, most from the 18th and 19th centuries, although some from as early as the 16th um, and some from as late as the 20th. Uh, sorry, I've just noticed that that should be post-1900, not post-1990. However, as prolific as this custom evidently was, uh, it still remains a mystery to us, simply because no historical written evidence has been found explaining the practice. Why were such shoes concealed? What were their concealers hoping to achieve? But without written resources telling us the answers to these questions, we have to use the only evidence we have available to us, the shoes themselves. Now, for this paper, I'm going to focus on two of the case studies I've looked at. Um, both are pretty representative of concealed shoes um, and both from North Yorkshire. So the first case study uh, is the Ilkley shoe. So this is a child's leather shoe or, or clog um, with wooden soles, um, which is Victorian in style and was found on a, a narrow ledge up this um, fireplace, so just above the fireplace in this 17th century farmhouse. The second case study uh, is the Otley Cash. So this is a cache of five shoes found in the roof space of a townhouse in Otley, six miles away from Ilkley. Uh, the shoes all date to the 1860s, but they represent quite a variety. Um, so here we have um, another child's leather shoe, um, a woman's button boot, a man's court shoe with a black cotton bow, uh, another man's court shoe, this one with a latchet tie front, um, and then a, a button up boot, uh, a lace up boot. So as I've said, we have no written records explaining why these shoes were concealed. So what can we deduce from the shoes themselves? Well, the obvious place to start is the locations of their discoveries. Now we have to be uh, really careful not to overinterpret the evidence. Uh, just because an object is found in an unusual location doesn't necessarily mean that it was deliberately concealed there. Uh, as I said, accidental loss could account for some concealed shoes. However, I don't think this is the case with these examples. So the Ilkley shoe found balanced on a narrow ledge up the chimney breast, a very difficult place to accidentally lose a shoe. And the Otley cache, five shoes, not five pairs of shoes, but five individual shoes in the roof space. Um, again, quite difficult to lose shoes there. Uh, now, chimney breasts and roof spaces are both very common locations for concealed shoes, um, with 26% of them discovered in or near chimneys and hearths, 23% discovered under floors or above ceilings, with the roof space being the fourth most popular place for concealment. And one thing unites these different locations, their liminality. Now, the roof space of a building has a peripheral location separating sky from house. It therefore represents marginality. The, ch the chimney also inhabits that indeterminable transitional area between inside and outside, a grey area that is, according to Mary Douglas, dangerous. Danger lies in transitional states, she writes, simply because transition is neither one state nor the next. It is indefinable. However, from the perspective of a person living in the 18th and 19th centuries, it wasn't necessarily the indefinability of these liminal domestic spaces that made them hazardous. It was instead their practical vulnerability. See, the outside world was rife with dangers, populated with malevolent forces that the home needed protection from. Scott, writing his discovery of witchcraft in 1584, listed the plethora of forces to be feared spirits, witches, urchins, elves, hags, fairies. 
These were forces forever threatening to infiltrate the household from outside, and it was believed that the peripheral areas of the building provided access for them. As James first wrote in his Demonology of 1597, uh, concerning popular beliefs of witches' familiars, some of them say if that being transformed in the likeness of a little beast or fowl, they will come and pierce through whatsoever house or church, though all ordinary passages be closed by whatsoever open the air may enter in at. It was the marginal areas of the structure, therefore, such as the roof and the walls, which contained tiny access points, which were considered the most vulnerable to these outside threats. Uh, the witch, a particularly liminal figure, was often accused of entering houses through similarly liminal areas, uh, particularly the chimney. And this explains why so many protective charms and objects of this period inhabited these marginal areas. For example, um, dried cats and horse skulls, and apotropaic protective uh, devices, are often discovered uh, bricked into walls or under hearths or under thresholds. Uh, similarly, witch bottles, um, which you see on the left here, uh, so these are kind of bellamine uh, jugs or flasks which um, contained a variety of objects from uh, urine, human hair, in this image we see um, metal, metal nails uh, which were meant to counterattack uh, a witch's spells um, and these were often buried beneath thresholds or beneath hearthstones. Um, we've also found numerous examples of inscriptions in invoking the protective power of the Virgin Mary. Uh, so these we see here uh, with M's or double V's possibly standing for Virgin of Virgins. Uh, and these were marked into doorways, roof beams and fireplaces um, to protect the household. Um, and it was for the same protective function that herbs such as vervain and dill were usually hung above the threshold. So if we consider the location of um, shoes in similarly marginal areas of a household, it's easy to interpret the concealed shoe as another type of apotropaic device alongside dried cats and witch bottles. But does the shoe itself attest to that purpose? Well, the protective items I've just discussed, uh, discussed um, concealed cats, uh, horse skulls, witch bottles, scratched invocations. Now, these may appear to have more obvious preternatural functions than the seemingly innocuous object of the shoe. However, the shoe does have a long history of ritual significance and popular beliefs. Now, Murray credits this to the foot being a liminal extremity on the cusp between us and the soil. Feet are on the frontier, and it is around frontiers that rituals accumulate. And so, according to Murray, it's the liminality of the shoe uh, that resulted in its prominence in worldwide superstitious beliefs, such as its association with luck and bad luck. Uh, for example, it's considered unlucky to put your left shoe on first, to find a knot in your shoelace, to place a new shoe onto a table. It is, on the other hand, considered good luck to throw an old shoe after somebody as they begin a journey. As Radford and Radford write, until very recently, shoes were often thrown after ships leaving port or people beginning a journey or a new enterprise or taking up new work. By doing this, the throwers conveyed luck to ship or individual concerned, probably because they were endowing them with little of their own life essence or strength. Now, that's why we see here Queen Victoria throwing a shoe after her soldiers as they depart for the Crimean War. The shoe is also associated with concepts of fertility. Um, if a woman places a shoe on a table, it foretells the birth of a child. Uh, if a woman tries on the shoe of a woman who's just given birth, she too will soon conceive. And the practice of throwing shoes at a wedding may stem from uh, some notion of deterring demons who might cause barrenness. The shoe's association with fertility may explain why so many concealed shoes, such as the Ilkley shoe and this one from the Otley Cash, uh, belong to children. Uh, perhaps the concealed shoe was designed to ensure fertility, or perhaps it was meant to protect the children of the household. Uh, a North German superstition, for example, maintains that so long as the child's first shoe is kept within the house, the child will come to no harm. In terms of having a protective function, uh, one theory is that, in popular belief, evil spirits didn't like the smell of burning leather. Uh, in Britain, fairies were believed to be repelled by strong odours such as uh, garlic um, and the burning of an old shoe, um, and demons didn't like the smell of burning leather either. Um, and this may explain why so many of the concealed shoes, uh, such as the Ilkley shoe, were deposited in or near chimneys, fireplaces and hearths. 
maybe they were originally meant to be burnt, but over time, simple proximity to fire was seen as, um, as good enough. Another theory regarding the protective function of the shoe is put forward by Ralph Merrifield in his book The Archaeology of Ritual and Magic. He hypothesizes that the tradition stems from the tale of John Sean, uh, a parish priest from Buckinghamshire and one of England's unofficial saints. Now he was believed to have conjured, uh, captured a devil into a boot. Uh, we see the, the boots uh, highlighted here. Um, and here, um, in this 13th century church carving, we see a, a demon's head uh, poking out of a shoe. And the shoe therefore became a type of spirit trap in popular belief, um, able to capture and imprison demons. Now this bit may be due to its kind of bowl-like shape, um, which can act as a type of container. However, the shoe is also believed to act as a lightning conductor, to use Easton's phrase, in diverting the supernatural force from entering the house. Um, they were, according to Easton, positioned to act as a decoy to the expected entry of the witch or her familiars, diverting them from their real quarry, the family in the house. And as Eastop writes, it is believed that such garments, when placed near chimneys or other points of entry to the buildings, would attract the attention of malevolent forces, which might otherwise enter a house and harm the household. In this way, the garments may be understood to have the agency of a law. So the evil spirit, uh, the demon or the witch or her familiar, um, see the shoe and believing it to be a member of the household, attack the shoe instead, thus becoming trapped inside it. But why would the spirit perceive the shoe to be a member of the household? Well, shoes are highly personal items. Uh, Murray believes that as bearer of the individual's imprint, the shoe functions as a signature, a spiritual graffito. A shoe, therefore, is intrinsically linked with its wearer, and that the concealed shoe represents a member of the household is a theory originally put forward by Swan. Why the shoe, she asks? Because it is the only garment we wear which retains the shape, the personality, the essence of the wearer. Um, and just a modern example of this, I, I don't know if anyone saw it in the news quite recently, but in Paris, um, where they had to cancel the um, the the march for the um, the climate change conference um, people left their shoes instead of being able to take part in the uh, the, the protest uh, the march they left their shoes um, as kind of substitutes for themselves uh, so if you've seen the pictures kind of whole squares of Paris were just strewn with neat, neat, neat rows of shoes um, and just the variety of shoes show what people chose to kind of represent themselves in place of of their presence um, so just showing how shoes can work as kind of metonymical or metaphorical um, links with their uh, their wearers. And by retaining the foot shape, sorry, going back to the paper, um, the shoe becomes a metaphorical symbol of the wearer, um, and we see this in popular culture all the time, um, where shoes become symbols of uh, characters and personas. Um, along with the many mantras regarding shoes. So, put yourself in my shoes, the shoes on the other foot, uh, the title of this paper, if the shoe fits, wear it. So the shoe becomes a symbol of its wearer. This metonymical link, however, makes the shoe more than just a diversion or a law. It becomes a protective power in itself, endowed with the, the wearer's power. Now, other items of clothing are imbued with a similar power, um, and nowhere do we see this more clearly than in the 19th century fairy tale told by Hartland, uh, which I'll just read out. So, it appears to be enough to lay over the infant or on the bed beside the mother a portion of the father's clothes. A shepherd's wife living near Selkirk was lying in bed one day with her newborn boy at her side when she heard a sound of talking and laughter in the room. Suspecting what turned out to be the case, she seized in great alarm her husband's waistcoat, which was lying at the foot of the bed, and flung it over herself and the child. The fairies, for it was they who were the cause of the noise, set up a loud scream, and subsequently departed, having caused no harm. The suggestion seems to be that the sight of the father's clothes leads the good people, i.e. the fairies, to think that he himself is present watching over his offspring. And the same could indeed be true of shoes, where the shoe represents the wearer and, in a sense, protects the household by its very presence. And for this notion, we might want to look at the conditions of the shoes. So of the hundreds of thousands of concealed shoes recorded in the Northampton Index, 
only 2% appear to be new or in good condition. The remaining 98% are all old, damaged, highly worn, some even appearing to have been deliberately slashed or soiled. Um, the Ilkley shoe has a seemingly unserviceable hole in its toe. Uh, the shoes of the Otley Cash are all frayed, um, with holes, very, very worn, and were in much worse conditions before um, Otley Museum decided to restore them. But they kept one um, in its original condition, um, so this is what quite a lot of them looked like when they were first found. Uh, this isn't even really recognisable as footwear anymore and shows that the condition that these shoes tend to be concealed in. Um, taking a look at a few more examples, so the Woodchester shoe, the Hursley shoe, um, the, the pair of boots found in uh, the roof space of the Savoy Chapel in London, again very, very worn. Um, so perhaps shoes are only imbued with the wearer's essence and protective power if they've been worn by them for a long time and their imprint in them is thus amb unambiguous. However, there is a simpler explanation for their old and damaged conditions. Shoes were expensive items. On average, a pair of shoes would have cost a week's wages. So these weren't items that would have been casually thrown away, um, but will have been repaired, modified and altered until they were no longer serviceable as footwear. Then and only then would they have been discarded or recycled as concealed shoes. Now perhaps this too explains the prominence of children's shoes. Um, maybe they were used so often because children outgrow their footwear much regularly than adults do. Um, so a shoe will, um, a child's shoe will quickly become redundant um, as footwear, dispensable enough to be utilised in ritual. However, I don't believe that old shoes were used in such a way only because they'd lost their value as footwear, but also because they'd gained value as being old and well used by being imbued with their wearer's essence. It was, in my opinion, for both reasons simultaneously, that the old and damaged shoe was recycled as a ritual object. So in conclusion then, um, as you've probably noticed, I've not been able to provide any definitive answers about concealed shoes. Um, it's all been speculation. And the only way to know for sure why they were concealed is to speak with the 18th and 19th century concealers themselves. Very difficult to do. What I have hopefully demonstrated is that by looking at the concealed shoes themselves, I've been able to flag up some working theories. Um, so the locations of the shoes, liminal, in particularly uh, vulnerable areas, uh, attest to their function as apotropaic devices. Um, the utilitarian functions, footwear, separating uh, the foot from the ground, suggests that they too were viewed as liminal objects themselves. Um, the shapes of shoes, um, bowl-like, able to act as containers, credits the theory that they could have been viewed as spirit traps or demon traps. The materials of the shoes, leather, um, also credits the theory that they were used to repel malevolent forces, said to dislike the smell of burning leather. Um, their conditions, old, well-worn, retaining the shapes of their wearers, allows for the theory that such items could have been apotropaic because they were imbued with the protective essences of past wearers. In conclusion then, uh, although we're left with as many questions as answers, I've hopefully shown that the materiality of the concealed shoe is an invaluable resource in attempting to understand this practice. And in doing so, I've hopefully also shown the value, the logic, of applying archaeological method methodologies to the study of a folkloric practice. And I'll end with um, a, a plea. Um, so in October of this year, I started work on the Inner Lives Project, so a Leverhulme funded project at Hertfordshire. Um, and my strand of the project is called The Concealed Revealed, and I'm trying to um, gather as much data on concealed objects as I possibly can, um, and hopefully discover some unrecorded um, instances. Um, so if you are aware of any concealed objects, not just shoes, anything whatsoever, um, that someone stumbled across while renovating a house, um, please either contact me on my uh, email address or on uh, the website. Uh, the concealed revealed. Um, thank you. Thank you.